Uh, my talk is going to uh, basically complement uh, uh, Gary's talk. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, quite similar things, but from a, a somewhat different point of view. Um, uh, so I'm going to be talking about about mass collaboration in science. The sort of these first three talks this morning are about uh, sort of changing in the method of scientific discovery, how discoveries are made. Um, I want to just start by reminding you, we, we take some of the sort of products of mass collaboration uh, for granted, but I want to remind you of two examples that you certainly know uh, uh, very well. Uh, the first is uh, Linux, um, which started uh, at August 26, 1991, to 12 a.m. when a 21-year-old Finnish student, Linus Torvalds, posted this message to a, a news group basically saying, hello everybody out there using Minix, I'm doing a free operating system, just a hobby won't be big and professional, da 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 da. Okay, and, and we all know how that turned out. I should point out that actually uh, interest was almost immediate, so that was 2.12 a.m. Twelve minutes later somebody replied with, you can't make this up, tell us more. Um, and, and of course uh, quite a lot more uh, did ultimately happen, it turned into the multi-billion dollar uh, a Linux industry. A very similar start to Wikipedia. Um, same basic thing. Here's the announcement that it was up. Three lines from Larry Sanger. Um, and I mean, Wikipedia just absolutely uh, took off. I think in both cases, much to the surprise uh, of, of the people uh, who were involved, the people initiating those projects. So I want to ask the, the question, whether or not similar sorts of open source principles and ideas of mass collaboration can be applied effectively to change the way we solve scientific problems. And there have been some interesting experiments done. I, I want to start with what I think is perhaps the most striking of those experiments. Um, it was done earlier this year. It started on 27th of January uh, of, of this year. Um, it was run by um, Tim Gowers, who's a mathematician uh, at Cambridge University. Uh, he's a very good uh, mathematician. He, amongst other things, has received the Fields Medal, which is perhaps the, the highest prize uh, in mathematics. And uh, uh, amongst other things, uh, he happens to be uh, a blogger. He's been blogging for a, a few years. Um, it might surprise you to learn uh, uh, perhaps that uh, actually quite a few, there, there, there's a very active mathematical uh, blogosphere. And the post he put up on that day asked a very interesting question, which is, is massively collaborative mathematics possible? And so what he proposed was to attack a hard mathematical problem completely in the open on his blog. Uh, in fact, ultimately it spread not just to his blog, um, but to other blogs and also uh, to a wiki uh, as the medium of collaboration. So there were, there were three main places it took place. There actually it, it spread out over many, many blogs, but the, 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 I think the three main places were on his blog, the blog of Terence Tao, who's another uh, uh, well-known mathematician, uh, and also uh, uh, on a wiki, uh, which I helped set up for them. Um, and, and the basic idea was that it was going to be carried out in comments uh, on the blog, this, this collaboration. So anybody could follow along uh, on you know, the solution of this problem, or the hoped for solution of this problem, and if they had an idea, they could just chip in and, and make a comment. You didn't have to, it didn't matter who you were. Um, I'll, I'll come back a little bit uh, in, in a minute to, to who actually did chip in. Um, the, the problem, I'm not going to say in detail, but it, it was a result uh, known as the density hales dewitt theorem. Well, that's what they ultimately ended up uh, focusing uh, uh, on. And, and to understand in sort of a hand-wavy uh, way what this is, imagine you're playing noughts and crosses, but not in, in two dimensions, but in many, many dimensions. And you're going to, you're going to try and you're going to, you're going to play place pieces uh, uh, inside your n-dimensional noughts and crosses noughts and crosses board, and you have k squares on a side instead of, of three. So what the density hales dewitt theorem says is that as the number of dimensions gets really, really big, if you fill in even a tiny fraction of the squares, you will be forced to have a line somewhere. It doesn't matter how clever you are in, in terms of placing pieces, you'll be forced to, 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 to put them in somewhere. Um, and the actual result is slightly stronger than that, but, but that gives you, roughly speaking, uh, uh, the flavor uh, of the result. Um, a proof of this theorem was known uh, already prior to that, but it used uh, advanced techniques from uh, ergodic theory. And what Gowers was hoping for was what he called an elementary proof, um, more, more or less. Well, that, that's what the, the, the ultimate goal turned out to be. Um, the, the reason for that is that this, this theorem, it was one of a, there's a whole bunch of, of similar results, um, 
which had started out being proved by using advanced techniques and then simple, relatively simple uh, uh, proofs had later been found, uh, and that had turned out to have uh, uh, to lead, help lead to some major breakthroughs. If anybody's familiar with, with the Green Tau uh, uh, theorem, uh, that, that's an example of one of the things that, that kind of came out of similar earlier work. So it, it, it was a difficult, it was, a, it, it was a challenging for, for some of the, the, the top mathematicians, this, this kind of uh, a program, this, this approach. Okay, so he opened the conversation up on February the 1st. He spent a few days talking about rules of collaboration, uh, this kind of thing. And over the next 37 days, there were 27 contributors who wrote comments on the blog, substantive mathematical comments. There were more than 800 comments made containing 170,000 words. Gower said, it, this process is to normal research as driving is to pushing a car on his blog. Um, it, I mean, you think about what 800 uh, uh, comments is, so these are substantive uh, uh, comments. Um, that's roughly one an hour over the 37 uh, days on average. Uh, and it really was, it was kind of, you, you'd wake up in the morning and you'd go and check and, and there'd be a bunch more comments there. Okay, so after the 37 days was up, Gowers announced that he thought that the problem was probably solved. In fact, not, not his original problem, but a, a slight generalization uh, uh, of it. And a write-up is now underway. So, yeah, that, that was, I, I think, a very impressive piece of essentially open source uh, mathematics. And there have since uh, that time, several other uh, similar projects have started up there, uh, including uh, the so-called polymath uh, a blog, uh, which is intended to act as a general sort of platform uh, for more such collaborations. So this is an example, in some sense, of you know, how I think about it, uh, of the restructuring of, of, of expert attention. So these people, you know, the, these very good mathematicians, uh, were, were paying attention to one another, or the, the, the medium of the blog or the medium of the wiki enabled them to, to, to pay attention to one another, to talk to one another in, in a way uh, that ordinarily is simply not possible for them. And, and the reason why this is, is important is, in some sense, expert attention is the ultimate scarce resource in science. That's, that's the bottleneck. You know, if you have access to John von Neumann's attention for a few minutes, um, that's going to help you an awful lot in, in solving a, a rather wide class uh, of problems. And so if you can restructure expert attention, at least potentially, it can be allocated much more efficiently. And that's what these tools uh, are doing. So that's one story. I think it's a small part of a much bigger transformation that's currently going on right now, a transformation in how discoveries are made. The, the stuff that Gary Wolf talked about is, is, is also very much a, a part of this sort of broader a picture that's enabled by online tools that augment our collective uh, cognition. So uh, as a second example, I want to talk about how these online tools, very similar, uh, but, but in a slightly, slightly different way, are changing in some sense who can be a scientist. So Gary has, has talked about this. I'm going to talk about a different uh, a project, the so-called Galaxy Zoo. Uh, project. So this is kind of crowdsourced astronomy. Um, what they've done is they've recruited more than 100,000 uh, online volunteers. Here's a, a recent meetup of some of the, the volunteers. This is at the Royal Observatory, basically yeah, Greenwich. Um, and what they're doing, or what they started out doing, actually it's, it's gradually broadened over time, is they're classifying galaxy images. So they started out simply looking, um, you, you'd be shown images of galaxies and you'd be asked, a simple question, is this a spiral, is this an elliptical uh, galaxy? And for these examples, which I've got up here, it's very easy, of course, to, to say whether it's a, a spiral or an elliptical galaxy. But if you actually go in and, and, and look at it, which I strongly encourage you to do, to sign up, uh, you know, these are little tiny smudges, basically. It's real hard to, to tell. They give you training. Uh, you have to go through a little training regimen before you're actually allowed to classify uh, galaxies. And most of the, uh, the galaxies, I think, are now typically classified uh, by 30 people on average, so they can eliminate uh, kind of uh, one-off errors. Um, th the reason they're doing this, funnily enough, is that humans still surpass the best computers at doing this kind of classification. It sounds ridiculous, but, but it's true. Um, and, and the images, uh, I should say, are, are taken by a robotic telescope, actually, in, in New Mexico. So they've never before been seen by, by any human eye. They've classified more than one million galaxies, more than 30 million actual images. Actually, they're, they're well beyond that now. Those, that's old numbers. Um, and th th they've made all kinds of really interesting uh, 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 discoveries. So one that received some, some press attention, I'll talk about some that, that haven't in a minute, but one that received some, some press attention is the so-called Vorwerp. So what happened was that one of the volunteers uh, came, came in, she just posted to, to their forum, um, the Galaxy Zoo Forum, 
and said, here's an interesting image, but what's this blue blob underneath it? Uh, she didn't know, and uh, it turned out that nobody else on the forum uh, knew, and they consulted other astronomers, and they didn't know uh, either. And actually, ultimately, there turned out to be a, quite an extended discussion about exactly what it is. And they have a theory uh, now. I put, there's a published uh, paper. Um, uh, basically, the, the theory, in short, uh, is that, this, that the galaxy above it uh, ripped another galaxy to shreds, and what you're actually seeing is hot ionized gas and the reflected light uh, of the galaxy, and, and that's what it is. It's not actually the blue is false colour, but, but that's the basic idea. Um, and, and, and so Hanny van Arkel, the person who, who noticed this, uh, was a, I think she's a 25-year-old uh, Dutch school teacher. And, and they've yeah, got this, this paper uh, has, has now, uh, I think, appeared, in fact. You, you see, in fact, Hanny's, she's the, the fourth author on the paper. Um, and this is, is since broadened. So that was the first Vorwerp ever, ever discovered. And they, they've gone Vorwerp hunting. Um, they've found a, a whole bunch, there's, there's a Vorwerp project there, and they've got a whole bunch of people who specialize in trying to find these objects. Right, so, so here's actually one. You'll see why it's hard for them to, to, to find the objects. You know, it's pretty indistinct. That's, that's the Vorwerp there. But they found a whole bunch more of, of these objects, and there's, there's a whole lot of people involved. So that's one example. There are many such sort of similar examples. Uh, here's a woman named uh, Ada Berges. I, I'm not sure I'm saying her name correctly, Berges. Um, she's from the Dominican Republic. She lives in Puerto Rico. Uh, she's uh, basically, I mean, she's, she's uh, a mother. She's stayed at home for the last uh, uh, 30 years. And she got involved with Galaxy Zoo. And her quote, I went to Galaxy Zoo and my life changed forever. It was like coming home for me. She's been very involved in many different things. This is from the, the Galaxy Zoo blog. Um, uh, uh, one of the things that she's done, many, the many things that she's done, uh, she discovered, um, she, she, she found a particular image, she said, this is interesting, I don't know quite what it is. It, it doesn't look very good, that's why I don't have a picture here. Um, well, not so interesting. Um, and, and talked to other people about what it might be, and it turns out it's what's called a hypervelocity star, which has a very unusual velocity relative to the galaxy. It's about 4,000 kilometers per second. It's traveling relative to uh, all the other stars. And a few minutes after she found that, she found another one. So she found two in quick succession. And actually, she and a bunch of other people set up the hypervelocity star project. So it's a bunch of Galaxy Zoo volunteers who are going out through, and, and they're finding uh, many more such examples of, of hypervelocity stars, of which uh, there, are, there are some uh, have been known, have been found previously, but they're really increasing the number. Okay, so this is Galaxy Zoo is part of a general broadening. Uh, in some sense of who can, can be a scientist. Gary Wolf was also talking very much about, about this, this kind of thing, and it's being uh, you know, it, it enabled by, the, by these new tools. So it's just some more examples. There's the Cornell Bird Project. Uh, it's not actually, it's not really, in, I call it the Cornell Bird Project. It's really many, many different projects. But basically what it's doing is it's taking advantage of the fact that there are millions of amateur bird watchers around the world, and it's asking them to collect up their data and to submit it in structured ways. And they've, they've used this, they've, they've written dozens of papers uh, using the, 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 the data. Um, just uh, from a couple of years ago, three years ago, uh, they, they made an interesting discovery, which is uh, there was an unexplained die-off of wood thrushes across North America, uh, and they noticed through their data that it was actually correlated with acid rain. Um, and, and so that's believed now to be uh, contributing as a causal factor. Uh, they've also uh, very recently started uh, to use their data uh, to track the impact of climate change. Okay, so those are two projects. Uh, they're two of many uh, uh, examples. I've put up a bunch more here, and, and you can find perhaps a couple of dozen. They're all following the same basic template. Um, basically, what they're doing is they're taking a very large scientific problem and they're cutting it up into tiny, tiny little pieces. The pieces are so small that you can train individuals who don't necessarily have PhDs uh, uh, to, to, to solve uh, the problem, and, and they can make a real contribution. Notice, by the way, that all of, I, I think nearly all of Gary's uh, examples also fit into this same basic kind of template in some sense. So what it's doing is it's lowering the barrier to entry so more people can contribute, and in fact, they're achieving a greater aggregate output than the pros could achieve. That's what happened, that's what motivated Galaxy Zoo, is actually a, a, an astronomer was classifying galaxy images, and he realized that with his, the resources he had available, uh, you know, amateurs could probably, could probably outcompete him. 
He was very surprised, though, by the actual scale. So I've described ways in which online tools are restructuring expert attention and changing who can be a scientist. They're doing many, many other things, which unfortunately I don't have time to talk about. Uh, one of my favorite things that, that have been mentioned a few times, I, I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd mention it again, is in some sense they're creating entirely new fields of science by, by doing things like data binding uh, on the human genome and the haplotype map. OK, so that's all good news. Uh, bad news, uh, unfortunately, much of the potential of online tools for discovery is going uh, to waste. Uh, scientists are showing, in some ways, a, a puzzling reluctance to use these, these tools for augmenting our collective cognition. Um, I'll just give you one example. Um, it's Wikipedia. So Wikipedia has this wonderful mission statement. Imagine a world in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. That's our commitment. So this sounds like the kind of thing that a scientist would be able to get behind. Um, they can get behind it all right uh, with uh, knives. Um, um, well, I, I mean, in, in the early days, very few scientists uh, were involved. It's, it's become legitimized a bit, a bit more recently. But uh, you, you've got to ask, why, why is it that, that you know, so few scientists were involved? It was started by Jimbo Wales and, and Larry Sanger, uh, neither of whom uh, is scientists. Larry Sanger does have a background in philosophy, but neither of them were academics at the time. Um, and of course, the, the reason is relatively obvious, particularly if you're a scientist, which is that it was just viewed as wasting your time that could be spent on so-called useful things like papers and grants. It's a very common pattern in science. So I picked on Wikipedia because it's a familiar example. But actually, people have tried online comment si sites on, on papers. All of those uh, have failed, essentially. Uh, people have tried open peer review. That's failed. Uh, nearly all scientific wikis have failed. Uh, the, the social networks that have been built for scientists so they can find each other uh, and, and you know, do collaboration uh, have, have generally failed or have been at most very qualified successes. So uh, this, is, this is not too good. What's going on is that the projects which succeed, like the projects that I talked about at the start of the talk, like the Polymath project, sorry, that was that massively collaborative mathematics, uh, and Galaxy Zoo, are those which support conventional scientific goals like writing papers. At the end of the day, there's still a paper being written, or papers, right? And so you get credit for it as a scientist, and you get uh, promotions, and you get jobs, and grants, and blah, 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 all the standard uh, sort of, uh, of things. So this sounds, I mean, it sounds like a trivial, small-minded kind of a thing, that, that people are so concerned about this. But actually, I, I think it's the critical thing in, in this particular particular instance. These other ideas don't lead to papers and people, scientists, are simply not willing to support it. So, so scientists who step outside the conventional medium, even if new media would actually be, be better, they, they pay a large price in terms of not getting the respect of their colleagues and that's ultimately how they get jobs. So a lot of potential is going to waste. Um, I'll just finish with a question. This is actually, this is my sort of main interest at the moment, all the rest is, is preface, which is the question of how can cultural change within science be achieved uh, so that actually people start to take proper advantage um, of these new tools. Um, I, I won't say very much about it, I've just been told that I'm out of time, um, uh, but uh, I, I think that's a critical, a critical question. Okay, thank you all very much for your attention.